I, I was really honored to be one of the panelists on a FAWE uh, webinar that talked of women's education, women's empowerment. It was a great webinar. And what really stood out was the way FAWE was really working out to make sure it left no girl behind in terms of educating every girl child because they see the value of education. As women, when we, uh, when we strive out there for opportunities, equal opportunities with what men are getting, we need to be coming from a point of view where we are also skilled up, where we are also educated to be able to get those same opportunities. So Fawe is striving for education in the girl child. And Fawe also came up with a booklet of scientists uh, women in STEM. Uh, the link is down there. Download the book. Share it with someone who you think will feel motivated and inspired by it. It's a great move by FAWE as they strive to make sure that the girls and the women get to see and hear what the role models in STEM are doing in their lives. And we also had on the panel some two ladies who are feathering their education. You will learn a lot from them on how you can also make applications to get scholarship and sponsorship to also study in universities abroad. So they share valuable information in this, in this video. Make sure you watch and you learn. I also share challenges that women in general face um, in engineering and in male dominated industries. You will also get a tip here and there. Dr. Akinyi, also shares on the education in general of women what are the challenges and what are the opportunities that are there for them so watch the video and i hope you will get inspired opportunity to thank everybody that has uh, turned up for this uh, very important discussion and shortly i will be uh, requesting uh, lydia the national coordinator of uh, FAWE Zimbabwe, who is the moderator for the session to take up from me and lead us into the discussion. Lydia, please take up. Lydia, are you able to? Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Martha. It took me time to unmute. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Depending on which part of the country you are, welcome to this um, webinar, um, session three, parallel session three, sub theme three, uh, on women of African descent in higher education, uh, specifically looking at opportunities and challenges. Um, my name is Lydia Majgirapanze. I am with uh, FAWE Zimbabwe, uh, one of the chapters of FAWE that is being run in Zimbabwe. Um, I'll speak briefly about FAWE. So FAWE is a pan-African NGO that was founded in 1992 by five African wi women ministers of education, basically to promote girls and women's education in sub-Saharan Africa. The organization is a membership organization that brings together uh, ministers of education, um, vice chancellors, um, education policy makers, gender specialists, and human rights activists. Uh, FAWA has 34 national chapters in Africa, so you will find if you go to Namibia, you will find there's FAWA in Namibia. In Zambia, there's FAWA in Zambia. Zimbabwe, like I said, there's FAWA in Zimbabwe. So we have 34 national chapters in Africa. And this session is being um, hosted by FAWA. Um, without uh, taking much of our time, since we've uh, taken more time waiting to, be, uh, to start the session, I, will, uh, I would like to ask um, one of our, our members to just let us go through a small video, maybe six to seven minutes, which is a documentary. Um, so over to you.
Of all regions in the world, Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest rates of education exclusion. This is attributed to a variety of social, cultural, economic and political factors such as patriarchy, inequality, poverty, war and conflict, gender-based violence, harmful cultural practices such as child marriage, female genital mutilation, forced marriages, among others. According to a UNESCO UIS 2019 data fact sheet, as of 2018, 97.5 million children and youth in sub-Saharan Africa are out of school representing 37.7% of the global percentage. 52 million girls and young women are currently out of school compared to 45.5 million boys and young men in the continent. The Forum for African Women Educationalists, FAWE, has for the last 28 years existed to address the highlighted gender disparities in access, retention, participation and transition in education for girls and women in sub-Saharan Africa. The Pan-African Non-Governmental Organization is present in 33 African countries and is headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya. Through her inclusive, gender-responsive and game-changing models, FAWE has supported thousands of children and women to go through education to be self-reliant and productive members of their societies. Donc moi j'ai la chance d'avoir étudié et j'ai eu la chance d'avoir bénéficié des bourses de FAWE et je remercie FAWE pour ça parce que sans ces bourses là je n'aurais pas pu terminer mes études et aujourd'hui je dis Alhamdulillah je suis chef d'entreprise au Mali. I and other boys who are included in the Drew Inclusion Policy are today agents of change and agents of substance in our societies and has, have enabled us to access other opportunities, I being a lawyer, one of them. This is why FAWE's new strategic plan 2019-2023 will focus on molding girls and women to be drivers of change beyond their schooling years and make long-lasting impressions in their communities. We are getting into our new strategic plan, which is 2019-2023. And this new strategic plan, we are using basically three approaches. And the first approach is inclined on the fact that the, the environment changes. It's not static. And because of that, we shall use the adaptive programming to ensure that we are responding to the changes, which could be based on the uh, different analysis of the education. Uh, sector plans. The second approach is uh, we, sh we, we plan to take a rights approach and this is based on the fact that education is a right. We want to ensure that uh, all girls and women in Africa have the right to education. The third and final approach is uh, using the new business model that is within the plan and this one is uh, uh, focused on uh, mobilizing resources both internally and externally and the we want to ensure that we strengthen our partnerships, we strengthen our collaboration, and we are able to raise enough resources that can enable us to uh, accomplish all that we have planned within the strategy plan for the next five years. Focused on the education of girls and women, FAWE's new strategic plan advances a vision of inclusiveness through the acquisition of skills and values that assure the full deployment of potential. Given a successful track record, deep local knowledge, and Pan-African reach, FAWE is particularly well-placed to effectively collaborate with partners also committed to the sustenance of peaceful continent and world. Cognizant of the need for a multi-stakeholder approach in inequalities in education, FAWE will in the next five years lobby and mobilize like-minded partners to ensure that more girls and women enjoy a decent and quality education. I think governments and uh, the funding community would gain in really supporting organizations such as FAWE that has been in the trenches for the past uh, 25 years 
really advancing uh, the cause of uh, girls' education and women's empowerment. But currently, I think what is most important is to really equip young women uh, with the skills uh, that are needed on the job market, with um, um, additional uh, you know, skills beyond academic skills, uh, to really make a difference in the job that they do, but also make a difference in their community and in the society in general. It's extremely important for the partners to inject the funds and to support these women to go to the front, to be able to finish their studies, to be able to have at least a background. In the face of a growing learning crisis, we must redouble our efforts to leave no one behind. Without a radical increase of investment in quality education, children and youth across Africa will continue to be denied opportunities to fulfill their potential and to thrive. Right from the early years, girls are hit the hardest. This must change. Together, we must address the lack of education opportunities afforded to girls. Given the room, girls will propel the continent ever more towards the shared prosperity, peace, and stability envisaged under Agenda 2063. GPE is honored to partner with FAWE to encourage and support the uptake of gender responsive education sector planning. You can download FAWE's new strategic plan on the organizational website www.fawe.org forward slash publications. very much um thank you very much uh we are moving on with our webinar i'm i'm sure we've been able to all uh watch the video i'll just speak a bit about um the fact that fawe has recently launched its strategic plan 2019 to 2023 it has been highlighted by the video our focus areas are three changes in the environment looking what the country level education sector plans are talking about we can even think about changes within context. Look at COVID that has come in. It has really changed our context as countries looking at education. The second area that the strategic plan is looking at is rights-based approach. No woman or girl should be left behind in education. And the last area is the area of uh, new businesses. Um, with that, allow me to go ahead and uh, introduce our panelists for our webinar today. Um, I would like to start off by introducing Dr. Caroline Mary Goretti Akinyi. Dr. Caroline Mary Goretti is a lecturer at African Women's Studies Center, University of Nairobi, Kenya. She is in charge of linkages and collaboration uh, for Senate representatives. She also holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Gender and Development Studies and a Doctor of Philosophy in Anthropology then she also has a Master's of Arts in Gender and Development Studies and a Bachelor of Education in Linguistics, Literature in English. Currently, she is the Secretary General at Fawe Kenya Chapter. Um, she also does a lot of work with other organizations. Let me not mention that. So she is our first panelist. I'll go on to introduce our second panelist, who is Miss Mary Ayin. Miss Mary is a Fawe Commonwealth Scholar and a PhD student in social work at the University of Birmingham in United Kingdom. She has a master's degree in social research, that is social work and professional practice from the same university. Her PhD thesis will focus on mental health in Ghana, and she hopes to develop a model that govern, the government of Ghana, and obviously if other governments can also adapt it or adopt it to assist vulnerable groups. Um, then our third panelist, uh, panelist is Ms. Esther Njeri Muiriki. Ms. Muiriki is a Fawe Commonwealth Scholar and a PhD student in food 
um, and Nutritional Sciences at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. Your PhD thesis is on nutritional and phytochemical characterization of cowpea plant parts. Ms. Muriki is also a lecturer at Meru University in Kenya. And finally, we have Ms. Uh, Joy Makumbe is the final um, panelist. Ms. Makumbe is a qualified civil water and sanitation engineer. We have successfully led a number of teams in Uganda, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. Um, she is one of the 38 African female scientists from 18 African countries whose inspiring stories have been documented by Fawe with the aim of inspiring young African girls to rise above the retrogressive social norms and take up STEM careers. Ms. Makumbe's vision is to empower and inspire, and inspire girls and women led, uh, so this um, led you to start your own uh, organization called Joy Makumbe Trust in 2016 and she looks into career guidance for students and equipping them uh, with entrepreneurial skills. She also founded the Tech Girls Mentorship Program and uh, the Tech Girl YouTube channel to document your journey in STEM. Um, so these are the people we'll be interacting with and interfacing with in our webinar today. Um, with that, I would want to um, go ahead and um, start um, discussions with our panelists. I'll start with you, Dr. Caroline uh, Mary Goretti. Uh, my first question to you is, you are a role model for young women in academia. What is it taken to get to where you are? <clears throat> Thank you, Lydia. Uh, good evening, good morning, good day to all present here today. Uh, I am a trained teacher by profession, and I got to love teaching through my primary school teacher who was teaching me home science a lady. So when I did my master's in gender and development studies, I was told by my employer that is a teacher service commission that I'm irrelevant at the institution. So there was no space for me to utilize my degree in masters in gender and development studies. And therefore I applied for a vacancy as a social lecturer in a Kenyan university to go and work there. And I was admitted, I was employed there to start lecturing in gender studies. So that is what made me join the university, the academia. I also wanted now to have the freedom of academic outside the strict curriculum which I had gone through in, uh, in, um, in schools. Uh, before going to the university, I was a teacher trainer for 10 years. And uh, I wanted now, with now gender, which was not needed by my employer, was to use it in higher education. And I also had passion for research. Why women in society? It was I was always questioning what is it that can be done to women, and the research can, could only be done in higher education, like university. So I had to do go there because I wanted to contribute. And even before going to the university to teach, I had joined FAWE, the Kenyan chapter, as an ordinary member. And I was the link person between now FAWE and uh, teacher training college and in trying to introduce concepts of how to help women. So these are what has made me be in um, higher education and the university. Having done four years at Egerton, that is where I was at the first university I, I joined. Then now I'm at the University of Nairobi still at the African women now dealing with women issues and uh, trying to harvest the voices of women so that we can join the, the discourse and the talks about women. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Mary Goretti, for, for sharing your journey, for sharing your story some of uh, what seems to be challenges, uh, but that took you to where you are. Um, I'll go ahead and um, talk to our Commonwealth scholars. We have Mary and Esther. 
Uh, if you listened well to my uh, introductions, you see that they are really soaring. They are doing quite a lot. Uh, they are already uh, PhD students, which is quite good, and would want to hear more. Let me start off with, um, with Mary. As a young African woman in pursuit of higher education, what are some of the challenges that you face in that journey? Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Um, oh, okay. Thank you very much um, for this opportunity to be able to speak on this August occasion. I'm very much grateful to Poway and the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission for this um, opportunity. Well, higher education for women goes beyond getting us to school. It's about the provision of educational resources to ensure our retention in school and ensure we complete all levels of education with the skills required to navigate and adapt to a fast changing world. Now, the challenges are numerous, but it depends on where you wish to pursue your higher education, whether you want to do it internationally or in your home country. And also depends on your marital status, whether you're a single person or a married person. But bear in mind that married women and in higher education are caught between two greedy roles. That's our family roles and responsibilities and our career aspirations. These are some of the things I observed with other people who were my colleagues in class. Now, women invariably na navigate between parental and career goals. So we have to pay the toll for crossing the boundary between career or work and family life. So time expended on role performance in one domain depletes time available in the demands of the other domain. So it appears we have to practice some kind of bias avoidance or devoid of care responsibilities to describe the desire to minimize or hide the thoughts for family and family commitments to achieve career success. So with me, one thing that I faced is inadequate access to economic and social opportunities. But some of these things were surrounded around financial difficulties, having money to pay for tuition, your maintenance and living costs, feeding, house bills, transportation, attending conferences, workshops, even having money for data collection for teasers. You know, pursuing higher education internationally is very expensive. And you need a lot of financial investment to be able to get far or complete all the levels of education that you really desire. So um, I believe providing conditional cash transfers, scholarships, just like what FAWE and the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission is doing, propels us towards that goal and be able to face all challenges that we come across during our um, education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And uh, it's good listening to you talking about pursuing higher education internationally is different um, yeah. from pursuing higher education probably at home. There are new challenges, there are emerging challenges that one faces. Um, you, you mentioned that educational resources alone are not enough um, to see one through, through their higher education. All those are things that you mentioned that we had to um, deal with you mentioned the importance of realizing that women have multiple roles and they have to balance all that and so excel in their education wow thank you very much mary i would want to hear just briefly again from esther around the same area how have you esther as a young woman in pursuit of higher education just managed to um to to deal with all this and what some what are some of the challenges that you face as you are pursuing your um higher education Thank you very much, um, Lydia, for this opportunity to speak in this forum. I think uh, for me, as Mary has said, is also as a woman, you have a lot of things to juggle between. And um, for example, for my master's, I had to fund almost more than half of my, of my research work. And uh, since I did my master's in Kenya, there was there, there's, there's a lot of, I think, um, for for lack of better words, I think it is very different when you're studying as a as a woman and as a as a young man. For for me, I have a family and I have a young family, 
so to be able to to um balance between studying and raising a family is really a, a major task and if here in africa i think in other continents maybe it's a bit better but in africa most of the time you're expected as a woman you're the primary caregiver of your of your family and of your children so there's there's uh, would say there's little help you know and yet when you go to class you are expected to perform as well and as as maximally as your male counterparts which is something that i feel that has especially when you're pursuing when you're a bit young you have no family you have no marriage i think it's it's much better it's much uh, easier and you are on the same uh, on the same level with your male counterparts but when it comes to higher education then there there's a lot of and even in the even in the job even in the at your workplaces when you say you are going to pursue your higher education there are all these other voices that come behind you you cannot pursue you have to wait if you, if you, if you pursue education then you lose your family then you'll not get married if you're single and um, also you are not able to i don't know i feel like also women we we suffer from maybe uh, feeling inferior sometimes because for the, the kind of scholarships or kind of funding that men go for you find that most women in the department they want to, to so you to not they are not you know they they don't go for it so i think also those are those are things that you have to keep telling yourself that you have to do so i think uh, like uh, mary said those are some of the challenges that i have uh, that have really faced especially in africa the society does not recognize a woman trying to pursue their studies especially when they're young thank you very much mary thank you for sharing your story thank you for sharing practical things that sometimes we do not consider or look at sometimes when one receives a scholarship we say it's good enough but the gender roles come in the gender dynamics come in how do you meet the expectations of higher education and yet uh, balancing up the roles that are expected to you as a young mother? How do you ensure that you keep your family in one place and yet you also want to pursue and study? Um, the considerations around resources required for research work. Um, all those are critical things that we should think of as we look at women in higher education. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would want to come back to uh, Dr. Uh, Margareti. Um, how can institutions of higher learning encourage uptake of science um, subjects or STEM subjects by African girls and women? And uh, how do we ensure retention in the same field? Uh, first of all, uh, STEM requires a lot of practice because this is what we have like uh, sciences and maths inclusive. So we need, first of all, to change the structures and also for opportunities and uh, interrogate social cultural assumptions we have about these subjects. Uh, when you have an issue like affirmative action in some countries, they lower the points for girls to join universities. That is a plus. But when other policies like re-entry policies are interfered with in some other areas, then it means that the girls who are promising will not join high, uh, higher, higher institutions of learning. For example, during COVID, Kenya has posted a lot of um, pregnancies, teenage pregnancies, and some of these girls could have been very good in, um, in, uh, in sciences. So if the re-entry policy is effective, then we are sure we shall have them back, we will not lose them. But how about other countries who do not have such kind of policies? So we need affirmative action for the girls. And we also need to change the socialization of the female child <clears throat> so that they know that sciences are not a domain for boys only, it is for both. And with this, again, we need also to remove sexual interests for girls 
who are interested in, in STEM subjects because STEM subjects are about practice. So there is no way a girl will practice if she's always doing the gender roles you talked about here, like fetching water, uh, fetching firewood, and such like things. We, they need to practice a lot. And, that, and if they can practice, then they'll do very well in sciences. Uh, a good example we have in a school here in Nairobi, which has been leading in maths. The reason also is because uh, in Nairobi schools, most teachers are female. They teach from class one to class eight, and uh, they, uh, they teach all the subjects. So the girls are encouraged to do the sciences because the teachers have taken them from primary to secondary and they are female, and therefore they are encouraged to do that. And this girls' school has been leading in maths, meaning that nobody is limited or is, it, it cannot do what the other human being can do. So if they are given the opportunity, girls can do well in STEM. And again, now when they come to the university, they can also do the same because the, hard, the, the hardest bit is in primary and secondary. If they can have good grades, do a lot of practice, then that will also help. And this can also only be possible if also we change the way we teach sciences, the way we teach um, technology to the girls. Remember, that is what we now are championing as far away on what you call gender responsive, responsive pedagogy. Sometimes a teacher goes to class and uses the same methodology, question and answer. And the girls have been brought up not to talk where boys are. So in a mixed, in a mixed classroom, girls will never participate. The boys will participate because they have been brought up to be very articulate, uh, to, to articulate their points and all that. So the teachers need to have to change the education of the girl child so that this girl can have freedom, can do group work where they feel confident. And beyond group work, they can also have remedial so that they do lots of practice after, even during the holidays or after school. We also need to have sponsored camps for girls. This is happening very well in countries like Ghana, where every holiday they keep, they have these girls for camps and they bring in role models. That is the girls who have done science. They talk to them so that they engage in these subjects. And that way they'll come to like it. If you don't have a role model, if you don't have experiential learning in such camps, then we will not have girls coming to the university to do sciences. Again, when they come for these camps or clinics, it will also help promote group behavior modification and also increase girls' confidence because in most cases, we are being brought up not to be talking where men are, you should be shy, you should be, uh, you should be shy, you should be vocal and all that. But when they come together, there'll be behavior modeling and peer mentorship. So we need more of this for girls. And lastly, capacity building as an opportunity. Let us not tell girls the way we were told that if you are a chop in maths, you are a weird girl. If you are, you should only do those kind of um, subjects, the arts. So all of us can balance out and this is what we encourage them to do. And when they come to the university, we also encourage them to, once they have affirmative action, we lower the points for them. They can do those uh, science subjects and that is what my prayer is for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mary Goretti. Um, as our panelists are speaking, if you have any questions or areas where you'd need them to clarify further, please just put them down. We have a moment um, at the end of the presentations to just go for um, discussions. You can even type them in our chat box. I see some people are, are typing in the chat box and others are also getting responses. Thank you, Dr. Mary Goretti, for mentioning quite a number of things. A gender responsive uh, policy or gender responsive policies are critical for encouraging girls. You mentioned also the importance of gender responsive teaching and learning methodologies 
practical activities for girls, innovations and experiential learning, all those are critical, as you mentioned, in terms of encouraging the uptake of sciences. I would want in that same um, line to go out now to Engineer Joy, we have Engineer Joy Makumbe, just to hear a bit, Engineer Joy, you are already working in this STEM field. What are some of the current and future opportunities in STEM that African girls and young women can take advantage of? Okay, uh, thank you, Lydia, for the opportunity. Greetings to everyone. Um, the opportunities which are there currently, you find there are uh, organizations like FAWE, there are people, or organizations that are offering scholarships for African women who want to do research, who want to further their education, be it masters or PhD, particularly in STEM um, courses, in STEM degrees, they are getting that opportunity because uh, many people have realized that girls have been marginalized for a long time now, but they are capable. So they are coming up with these um, with, with these uh, scholarships that are specifically for women and girls to further their studies. So that is something which is there. Then there are also things like workshops, you know, that are there for girls in STEM. Like what uh, Professor Akin is, is, uh, mentioned, that, you know, as girls, we are socialized to, to not speak out, you know, that we are not leaders, um, not to be assertive. So when we have those workshops for girls, either, either on leadership, you know, or, or on business, then we equip these girls to be more confident out there and uh, compete with their male counterparts for whatever uh, financing will be there available for, for business. So I think for, there are also mentorship opportunities uh, which are available. There are engineers, there are scientists who are seasoned who are available to mentor upcoming girls either in school or who are still starting off in university the mentors are there just to hold these girls hands to tell them what works what doesn't work to inspire and motivate them you know that uh, we've been there we've walk, walked that road before yes things can be tough but they are achievable so and um yeah i think that is and also you find that um these programs they also encourage girls to participate you know we can have all girls like what has been said all girls camps you know those opportunities which are there now for girls in stem you know just encouraging them to 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 to, to relax to be out there to be confident to, to you know to, to blossom you see and which is something which they could not do when they when they have those boys around so having more of those camps more of these workshops more of these scholarships i believe will equip um, our girls and our women to be more confident and more competitive out there. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you very much, Joy, for highlighting some of the things that we may not consider. You know, sometimes we are talking about encouraging girls to be in STEM, but there are life schools that are required, the confidence building, um, just encouraging them, empowering them to speak up, empowering them to venture into areas that they may have not wanted to venture into. Thank you very much for that. I would like to ask again, um, Joy, you are a female engineer working in a male-dominated career, I believe, and in a rural center in Mwanza, Tanzania. What are some of the challenges that you encounter as you carry on your day-to-day -day duties, as you are working, as you are doing your job? Do you face some challenges and what are some of these challenges? Definitely. Uh, as a woman who is an engineer, you do face challenges. Uh, also, based uh, on the fact that you're also in a rural setup, you find that um, we are socialized to just believe that women don't know. You know, especially when it comes to these things like engineering, you find a woman who is on site, you just, the, 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 your mindset just thinks, this girl is just here maybe for something else, but I don't think she really knows what she's doing. You know, so you find that you have to prove yourself. You have to prove yourself to know that I know this job and I know much more than what I'm actually supposed to do here. You see, they won't take it for granted that, oh, people have introduced you as the engineer there, so uh, you do know the engineering. They won't take that at face value. You have to show that you do know what you're talking about and um, you are there because you know that job. And of course, also they expect you to, you know, when they say, oh, the comments which they pass like, oh, this woman out there in the sun, do you think she'll last? 
oh, I don't think she's going to be standing in the sun for so long. Oh, I think she's just going to give up or she's going to whine or cry or things like that. But like for me, I get my hat. Of course, I'm not going to burn in the sun. I have my hat there. I put on my hat and I'm standing there supervising, you know, and they expect that I ah, will just see tears at one moment that oh, I'm tired or oh, I want to go home. I want to do this, but I'm there to do a job and I'm, and I'm there to do it well. So I do it well. And um, also this fact that sometimes people can come on site and the fact of leadership, what I was talking about, you know, when they come on site and I'm there maybe standing with a colleague, a male colleague or two colleagues, and they want to find out something about the site. Naturally, they'll go to the, to the men. Ah, uh, excuse me, uh, are you the ones in charge, you know, on this site? Uh, we want to find out maybe what is happening or we're from this department. Uh, we want information on this site. So what you have to do now, what, what I've learned to do is uh, confidently, and with grace, I just uh, uh, walk up to them. I introduce myself. Uh, gentlemen, welcome on this site. My name is Joy. I'm the engineer in charge on this site. You know, you find the look on their faces like, oh, okay. <laughs> you are in charge. Oh, not this guy. You know, and you know, I always make the, the guys with me laugh. You know, they give me that smile knowing that, yeah, Joy, we know we knew you'd come in at some point like that. So that's how I, I, I deal with it. And um, you don't have to be aggressive. You don't have to be um, harsh about it. But it's something which you know. It's, it's an education phase. I think uh, the, the more we see women out there, the more men will realize that we are having more and more women engineers who are out on site and not just take it for granted that when we mention engineers, we talk about men. Thank you, Lydia. Very exciting, Joy. I can imagine uh, people coming to a site and they are looking for a man to, to help them. They cannot believe that a woman can be an engineer. So you say, do you have to prove yourself? That's a whole lot more to do, not just only your job, but also to just prove that I'm actually capable. So women have to put in extra in terms of, uh, you know, being accepted and delivering in um, the STEM fields. Thank you very much, Joy, for sharing your experiences. Um, I'd like to come back to you again, um, Dr. Mary Coretta Kinyi. Um, just talking about leadership positions. Um, you are in um, academia, you are in higher education. What role can women in academia play to increase the number of women in leadership positions in the institutions of higher learning? Thank you so much, Lydia. Uh, leadership in the universities is based on uh, merit. There is no affirmative action at the university, you must merit. So what I would uh, advise is that we women should study leadership model closely. Next, they should be in a hurry to overachieve. Why am I saying that? In, acad in academia, there are things set out that you must have in order to go to the next level. There is nothing which can be given to you. So women must just work for it. Like I was being tutored at one time that um, if you want to be a leader at the university, you must be like Tyson in the boxing ring. You don't do points. Because if you do points with a white person, definitely a white person will win. But if you do knockout, eventually, automatically people will see you have won. So there'll be no dispute about that. So the same with leadership in academia. To be a professor, for example, there are papers you must write, there are research you must do, you must do supervision, and this, if they require three papers, for you to be a tiresome, you must make sure that as a woman, you have five or even six, so that if you go for an interview, they'll have no reason to take you because you have overqualified in whatever they want. So that is one thing women must be ready to do in leadership in, in academia where we are. <clears throat> Another, 
we must also address structural, structural barriers in the academy. For example, there are some like when it comes to things like funding, we must be in a position to get funding, to do research, to publish. You must be there to do what, you know, but you know, in the academia, it is really patriarchal because for a long time, we never had women in the academy. They are coming now. So they, that is why I was saying that they must be in a hurry to overachieve. Again, women must be ready to be trained as leaders. We must train as leaders. That's why I said at the beginning that we must study leadership model closely. What is it that is needed? And something we need to also we need to do as women in the academy, we must visit or join men club. Remember, after lectures, after work, women carry their bags, go home because of duties and all that. Men remain behind to the senior common room or to the common rooms to discuss matters of um, promotion, matters of how to advance and all that. And we miss out on all this. So it is high time women also join or visit so that we, and we, we join in the exchange of ideas and ask one another, how best can we achieve this? And this, this talk of collaboration and networking and all that, we also network with them, collaborate with them, we publish with them and do all those things with them. And uh, also to encourage women to be in leadership, there are low lying structures which doesn't need papers, like being in the leadership of alumni, being the leadership of, um, pension scheme, being in the leadership of union. These are low-lying fruits, positions of leadership for women, which you can grab as soon as we join the academy. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for talking about um, some of the things that women actually have to do. You said it's, it's not, it has to be by merit. You talked about women actually studying, training, um, looking for leadership models, you have to have information. Join men's clubs, do the things that will qualify you for leadership. Thank you, uh, Dr. Akini, for that. Um, I would want to move on to the two ladies, Esther and, um, and Mary. Um, just, I know it's difficult to summarize the journey, but I want to, in just in brief, maybe in two minutes, talk about your journey as a successful Commonwealth Scholarship beneficiary. And maybe tell us what, what, do, you, what do you think made you um, stand out and, and get the scholarship? I'll start with Mary. I see you are smiling, so we can start with you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before I start, I just want to use this opportunity to thank the CSC and the University of Birmingham for providing such opportunities, which ensures that I pursue my academic excellence with some form of financial control. So the journey began with me obtaining an undergraduate degree with a good class. So I needed to study really hard before getting into a university internationally or getting into the University of Birmingham. So I needed to also make a decision to pursue a master's degree at a national service. The decision to the decision on the program I wish to study or I wish to pursue and also seeking and surfing the internet for information about the schools in UK and other countries. Um, I often use Google, YouTube, scholarship positions, Power websites, educational conferences and some drop-in centers um, in Ghana. For instance, the UKS um, students um, help or drop-in centers um, for more information concerning studying internationally. Also finding available scholarship opportunities and eligibility criteria and requirements or criteria. Then reading more about application procedures, the processes, the requirements and the deadlines, then breaking down these information into action plans, goals and objectives. So I needed to prepare an academic CV personal statements and motivation letters, applying and getting the passports and passport pictures, letters of recommendations for my undergraduate lecturers and 
um, some organizations I worked with as a volunteer. Then I also had to send inquiry emails to schools and scholarship bodies to ask them about their eligibility criteria and how I could apply for um, their scholarships or funding. It also requires a lot of time and internet accessibility and personal strength. You need to believe in yourself. You need to have faith, be optimistic and being very patient. But one key thing that I think really helped me or made my applications stand out was the fact that I took small steps in the right direction, which turned out to be the biggest step of my life. Engaging in extracurricular activities such as volunteering in humanitarian and community impact projects. And these activities garnered for me experiences I could really reflect in my personal statements and CV. So I didn't just write that I was a president of this um, club or this association, but what impact did I make whilst being that leader or having some kind of leadership roles? What impact did I make in the life of a student? What did I do when I was um, a teaching assistant? These are all the things that really propelled me to get the scholarship because I was able to write about the experiences that I had. We should also bear in mind that the, the Commonwealth Scholarship largely focuses on the themes which reflect sustainable development goals. Therefore, right from the onset of my undergraduate study, I engaged in several leadership activities and humanitarian projects. So I had the opportunity to work with some notable NGOs in Ghana through my practical requirements for a social work undergraduate degree. These small steps facilitated my success in obtaining the scholarship for the master's. So I had a first-hand knowledge about social problems facing marginalized and vulnerable groups in Ghana. So I was able to write about these things. And I think these are the simple steps that helped me to get the scholarship. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Mary. Esther, would you like maybe in brief again, just it's, um, explain to us what made you stand out as a, as a, a recipient for the Commonwealth um, scholarships? Well, I think um... For me, I think what made me stand out, as Mary also has said, is um, my experiences since I have been, uh, I've been working with the university for quite a long time. And in the university, I have uh, played several roles. I have been club patron of different societies. As a, as a lecturer, but still, I, I, really, I really like engaging in the youth and I I think I put that even um, for before I even got my undergraduate, I went back to my secondary school and high school and the people in the village where I come from, I tried to mentor some of them and teach, do tuition so that at least they can, because I, I think I have a passion for education because I see that people when people are educated, the society becomes much better. So I really, I put those things there in my documents for all the things that I have tried to do, especially with young people. And I have, I think I have a passion for young people, both men and women. And so I put that there. And also my, I had a proposal and my proposal is working on how he lives. I, I don't know whether, how many people know them, but these are things that help women like economically. So I think also I tried to link my project to the benefit that it will help the women around or even the people around in terms of not only nutritional or properties, but also maybe economically, maybe we can find something to add value to it so that the people, the small scale people who are selling it or farming it in in the countryside can be able to benefit from it and also it's also very important that you link that everything you do is towards the sustainable development goals because that is what the world where the world is going zero hunger better wealth uh, you know better health and so it is so i think also linking the the way my proposal links to having zero hunger, because if you have good nutrition, then there's zero hunger, then you also are able to be economically productive. 
So I think so those are some of the things that I would say that, uh, and of course, also I have good transcripts, I, I think. I have good certificates that can help to show that I have made good progress in my past years. Thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, a lot of uh, takeaways there, uh, which I'm sure is, um, if we're minute taking, can also be shared with other young people who are in the process of trying to do the same, um, obtain a scholarship. And you mentioned a number of things that are very critical. Listening to you, um, I can tell that there's a lot of work that was done in CV development. It was not just a CV, but you really had to put effort in terms of developing a CV. You had to do extra activities, volunteerism, um, teaching, doing small things that would actually um, add value to your CV. Uh, a lot of preparation went in in terms of researching on the scholarships. Thank you very much. I think those are very important takeaways that can also be used um, to encourage other young people as they are applying. Some may be wondering, why do I keep applying for a Commonwealth scholarship and fail? Um, I'm going to get us into the ra last round of questions. And for this last round, I would ask that we use one minute, okay? One minute to respond to this last round of questions. And after that, that last round, we'll go on into our plenary session. So I'll start with you, Engineer Joy. Um, the last question, and in one minute, what role can you and other female scientists play to encourage increased number of young women in the field? Thank you, Lydia. We have to be role models. I think uh, Prof. Professor Akini mentioned something uh, to this effect. We have to be role models. There are so many awesome engineers out there who are female. They're doing awesome work, but we don't see them. You know, no one knows about them. But uh, the young girls in college, the young girls in school, they need to see. You know, that's why they, they love these superheroes on TV, because they see them and they want to be like them. So, and they need to see us. I'm, I'm grateful to Farway for this book that they compiled. Uh, the girls will be inspired by it. And following that, they need to see these engineers physically. We need to go out there so they see us, we engage them in person, and they are inspired and motivated. And we need to be mentors you know, as, as, as women in STEM, let's be mentors, let's get these young girls on board, you know, to show them that they might be intimidated in a room full of men, we give them tips on how to survive, you know, um, in this, um, in these male dominated industries. Um, we thank you so much, John. Thank you. Do you want to add some more? Just 30 more seconds? Um, it's basically that, you know, mentorship to, uh, because we've yes. been there. So we need to show them also how it's done. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Fawe, we are so grateful for the strides that you are taking in terms of having practical things to encourage girls. The inspiring stories from African women scientists booklets, I'm sure it would go a long way in terms of inspiring other young women to pursue STEM. Um, to you, uh, Dr. Akini, uh, my last question in one minute, what are some of the opportunities young women in academia are enjoying now that you didn't enjoy as a young woman when you joined the academia? Uh, thank you, Lydia. One thing we enjoy is equal pay. Uh, we are paid equally. There is no discrimination because it is structured. Number two, we are enjoying the same. Um, we have a infrastructure like toilets. Women never had toilets. Now we have toilets meant for women and not just ones converted for women. So that is a very good thing at the university in terms of infrastructure. We are also enjoying uh, that um, we have now many role models as women, even though we only have 3% of women, this is in Africa. But lecturers, there are quite a number of women we have around to mentor others. And lastly, in the university now, there are gender awareness, because remember I told the university is highly patriarchal, but at, at my university, we have um, a gender institute and we also have a center for women studies, the one of its kind in Africa. So those are good things for women, thank you. for the girl thank child. You thank you so much. You. Yes, thank you. Esther and Mary, just one thing. What role can you play to encourage increased number of young women in STEM? Just one thing. Um, 
I think still um, volunteer with PAWE to embark on capacity building and development programs for young women and using the experiences that I've had to encourage them that they can also be where I am or even more than where I am and they can do it. Yeah. Well, I think to reiterate what Mary has said is true. I think for me, it's just mentoring and showing them that you can really do it. And I think the fact that we we have come this far is also a good indicator to them that it can be done. And, and so we'll engage them. I think we'll engage them, especially the ones in the universities. Yeah. Thank you so much. It can be done. It can be done. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And um, I would like to thank all of you, all our panelists, Dr. Mary Goretti Akini, uh, Ms. Mary Muiriki, uh, Ms. Mary uh, Ayin, Esa Muiriki, and uh, Joy Makumbe. Thank you, Engineer Joy and uh, the rest of the panelists for really sharing your journeys, for encouraging us, for motivating us. Um, at this point in time, I would like to ask um, for any feedback from the participants. Do you have any questions for them? Do you have areas uh, which you want them to clarify further? Um, just raise your hand. I'll pick from the participants list and allow you to, to uh, unmute and speak. As we are doing that and I'm waiting for the hands, I'll try to read through some of the comments in our comments um, in, the, in the chat section and uh, just waiting for, for questions. Um, thank you to all the presenters, uh, the, some of the feedback coming in, um, appreciation again coming in from uh, Wendy, mentoring, uh, most people are also saying thank you very much for mentioning the role of mentoring. Um, Esther and Mary, thank you for sharing the application process. Um, those are some of the comments that are coming in. Um, I will pause and wait for questions uh or any uh, interventions from the participants please is there there is any participant who likes to talk kindly raise your hand and then i will unmute you to talk thank you very much uh, hello 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 we can hear you oh thank you so much my name is norma norma Ndiweni. i'm from lupane state university in zimbabwe I just would like to thank you very much for this amazing session. Um, I am a woman who is in STEM and uh, I really appreciate uh, all the stories that have been said. I think what is most uh, important for me and which I think that we need to take home is the message of mentorship, but also is the message of paying forward as well as paying backwards. There are things that we can do for those who went ahead of us, and there are things that we can do for those who are coming up behind us. And to make sure that we have a chain of assistance, um, a sister's chain, so to speak, so that the, the one who is ahead pulls on the one behind, who pulls on the one behind, and so on. I like the idea of um, university students, lady uh, students, assisting with the high school uh, girls who in turn can assist with the primary school girls so that we've got this unbroken chain of forever assisting each other so that we have a strong sisterhood and we have less of the pull head down syndrome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Noma. Again, the role of mentorship coming in there, hand holding, very critical to encourage the young ones so that when they get to higher education they can really take up the subjects and excel i'm waiting for more hands waiting for more interventions
If you are facing challenges, raising your hand, you can type your question in the comment section as I'm waiting for other questions. There is a question from Caroline Kanyago. Esther and Mary, what challenges are you facing due to COVID-19 crisis during your PhD studies, if any, and how are you navigating these challenges? Um, one of you can respond to that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, thank you, Carol, for your question. I think um, that one of the biggest challenges for me has been have not been able to progress with my lab work as I had been uh, as I had planned. Uh, but um, we have uh, we have now started doing online studies and started doing other things that you can be like publishing a paper. You don't need to be in the lab to publish a paper, or you can do a review paper. You can do a lot of things online. That's what I've realized, especially due to COVID. I have learned a lot of things online. I have read a lot of literature. So I think that is one of the things that's how we are trying to navigate these corona challenges. Maybe Mary, you can add on to something. Um, I think I'm doing the same thing. Um, basically taking all my courses online and um, trying to um, read a lot and having most of my face-to-face um, -face conversation with my lecturers via Zoom or uh, Microsoft Teams. So I think that is what we are doing concerning this crisis. There's nothing we can do but just to adapt to the situation and use technology to um, learn. Yeah. How best can we as women deal with to address that. Um, any of uh, the panelists to, to respond to that? Just in brief, we are almost um, rounding up our webinar. Lydia, can you repeat? You are off a bit. Thank you. All right. Um, so there is a question around affirmative action. How best can we as women deal with pushback against affirmative action? Uh, thank you, Lydia. As women should not give up what is ours, we should look for it. And affirmative action, it does not mean that we are weak. When you look at the gender roles, the impact negatively on the girl child, and that is why there's call for affirmative action. So we should never give up on it. But why it is not needed like at the university for promotion, we just have to be tiresome, knock out, knock out and work and get it. And link with others, connect with others, co-publish, do research together and all that and we will get it. Because there, there is no shortcut. But where there is uh, affirmative action, just strive for it and get it, look for it and ensure that it is there because it is the only way we can help girls get to STEM. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I hope you are answered, Noma. As we round off, we want to finish at eight. I'll read the last two questions that are in our chat um, box. Uh, the question from Dana Ijo is, my question is, how, do, how can we increase quality and access to mentorship in settings where mentorship is currently lagging behind. So she's talking about really how do we ensure that mentorship um, is not lagging behind in all spaces, probably at provincial level, district level. Sometimes it is there at a certain level and then lagging in other areas. So any of you uh, to respond, Joy, would want to take on that? Okay. For me, uh, in terms of quality, what I've done, you know, I've also um, started um, um, a mentorship, Tegel mentorship program. What I've done is for the mentors, their basic handbooks, which are there, just a framework, because mentoring sometimes it's personal, you know, there's a personal flair that someone might want to add onto it, but there are guidelines that ensure that um, your goal or whatever you want to achieve from that mentorship is being 
uh, is going to be achieved at the end of the day. And there's going to be feedback, you know, from the mentors, their, their, their forms in that handbook to say, uh, how did the mentorship go? Did they achieve their uh, goals? And just, just to mark, you know, that mentorship to say, how, how did they see it? And um, I think it has been mentioned, uh, there's a lady who mentioned that it's not easy to, to be everywhere at one, a, a, in one go. So you need to spread out. If we have um, like some, some girls in Harare doing mentorship, then we also have another group maybe in another town and like that. You know, although you're part now, it's very easy, you know, to communicate and to be in one group on WhatsApp in different locations. But we need people to be spread out. And if you're at university, then you also need to get girls in high school being part of the program and they mentor their own uh, peers. And uh, when the, the girls in high school will mentor the primary school children and the girls in university will mentor uh, the girls in high school, no, like that, because uh, uh, I, for me, being a professional woman, I cannot cover everything down to primary school. So we need to have those hierarchies in mentorship um, and have mentorship training so that everyone is equipped on how we, how we can mentor, you know, with quality. But having that, those different hierarchies, I think, will help. Thank you, Lydia. Okay, thank you very much, Joy. Um, I would like to thank you so much. Uh, that's an innovation. That's an innovation. Um, I would like to um, allow Prof. Sutherland, the chairperson of our Ghana, to say something as we close our session. Over to you, Prof. Sutherland. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I was quietly listening. I'm very inspired to, to see that there's another generation of, of, of young people who are going to carry on the work that we've been doing. We don't have time to talk very much, but higher education is the last bastion where there are so few of us. Um, and um, I think the, the, the work that has to be done to, to get girls to even know that they can reach the level of higher education is, 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 is a great deal. And I hope that we will be able to draft a lot of people at your level to come in and help us you know, to, to, to do this work. I'd like to, to round off by saying how inspiring everything is, but also to, to acknowledge the fact that we need to get young women to know that your grades are not enough and that you should have been participating in um, social work and, 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 and in voluntary work so that when you write your, your CVs up and you write your proposals up, you will, you will have the right profile to be able to get into higher education around the world. But let me thank you all for, for, um, for the work that you're doing and I wish you all the best in your careers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Um, I will not try to summarize or to give takeaways. You've done just that. Thank you for um, uh, saying all those. Um, as we close our session, um, I would like to um, ask our executive director, the executive director for Fawe Africa, uh, Martha Mwezi, just to say something as we close our session for today. Over to you, Martha. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia. And thank you to all the panelists, plus all the participants in this uh, discussion. I think all of us on this session are excited to see that there are many young people coming up, just like Professor Sutherland said. Uh, I'm not very young, I'm not very old, but when I listen to the young people like the Marys, like the Esthers, I think we all get uh, excited to know that there are many women in the struggle. I know a lot has been shared and uh, challenges have been mentioned, but where there are challenges, we can turn the challenges into opportunities. It's looking at everything positively. We all understand that the ground is not leveled. There are many issues that would deter the women or that would hinder the women from progressing much as they have the ability and much as they have the capacity. But in the yesterday, we had the, the yesterday uh, at which we were issues that were coming out in terms of as women, let's not wait let's demand for what belongs to us. Because if we were to be given, if the chances are limited, that whoever holds the power will want to hold on to the power. 
So it's for us to become proactive. It's for us to demand for what's right, what is ours and what's rightful ours. We are looking about equity. We are talking about equality, but we have to fight for it. And fighting is not physical fighting, but mental fighting, advancing the cause and advocating for the rights of each and everybody. I just wanted to say again, thank you so much to everybody. <laughs> this is the FAWE cause and the struggle continues. I also want to, in a special way, thank the AAU, that is the Association of African Universities, for being a good partner to FAWE and thinking of us at all times, because they also do appreciate the role that FAWE plays, particularly in the promotion of women and girls' education. We thank AAU again, and we pray that the, the partnership continues and let's all work towards the promotion of women and girls' education. Thank you so much, and Lydia, back to you. Thank you very much. That was our Executive Director for FAWE Africa, Martha Mwezi. Thank you, Martha. And um, as we close, um, just again to thank again um, Dr. Akinyi. Thank you so much for taking time um, to be in this uh, conversation. Thank you, Joy, Engineer Joy, for sharing your experiences as a civil engineer. Thank you, Mary and Esther, for encouraging other young women. I know other young women who were in this session are so much encouraged. Others who are listening have taken a lot from this conversation. Thank you so much for taking time. And I wish you all the best. I wish you very well as you pursue your studies and in uh, your future careers. I would also want to thank all the participants who took time to listen. I'm sure there are a lot of things that we've um, um, gained from you and that we've also gained from the conversation. Um, thank you again to the Association for African Universities. We are very grateful as far away. I see a number of names from my, of my colleagues from other Huawei chapters. I will not mention the names, otherwise I will miss some of them. But I see a number of colleagues from the FAWE Africa Network. Um, thank you, colleagues, for being part of this conversation. I see also names of some of uh, the very influential women in FAWE chairpersons, uh, members from our FAWE uh, chapter boards. Thank you very much for taking part. I see colleagues also from Anzefa. Thank you, Solange. Thank you, Matilda. Um, thank you again to FAWE um, Africa um, Secretariat. We have been coordinating. Uh, we have come to the end of our webinar for today. I wish you all a pleasant day. And to those who are going to bed now, uh, have a good night. Goodbye. <laughs> Yeah, and thank you. I don't want to forget, Lydia. Thank you so much, Lydia, for moderating the session. You have done it well. Thank you so much. Most welcome, Martha. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful night. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.